my name is Eric Allstrom. I'm from St. Mary's, Alaska, and I sit on our talk, Alaska C3. And I'll be introducing Sean Brigman for the cultural presentation on Salishan, Salishan Sturgeon Nose Canoes. Uh, Sean is a traditional artist for 16 years. Sean Brigman, PhD, is an enrolled member of the Spokane Tribe of Indians. Since 2012, Sean has sculpted five bark sturgeon nosed canoes harvested from ancestral forests. Four of his Salashan sturgeon nose canoe method creations successfully delivered water protectors who brushed the water on the Missouri River to the Cannonball River during the 2016 prayer journey to Standing Rock, North Dakota, with gathering canoes from the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. So, welcome, Sean. Thank you. So my name is Sean Brigman. Um, I descend from many of the regional plateau tribes. For example, the Arrow Lakes, Sinaiks, and Shushwap in British Columbia. And I'm an enrolled member of the Spokane Tribe of Indians here in Eastern Washington. And a few weeks ago, I developed, developed a uh, a feature, a feature uh, short video with Hamilton Studio. And so that's what we're gonna watch today. And then after that video, I was just gonna give a short little tour of the, the Hive Space, which is a new Spokane Public Library. And this Hive Space has allowed me to work on four canoes this recent winter. And then at that time, I can answer any questions as well. My name is Sean Brigman, founder of Salish and Sturgeon's Canoes. My dedication to this plateau canoe recovery arts practice has had a visible and positive impact on regional tribal communities. The recent awakening of spirit around water, river, and salmon, and even sturgeon, has included a return to canoe culture on the ancestral waters of Washington, Idaho, British Columbia, and Montana. For five consecutive years before the 2020 pandemic hit, I have been honored with the opportunity to sculpt my contemporary Salish and Sturgeon's canoe interpretation several times while demonstrating my assemblage method established in 2013 in multiple tribal communities. I started off my undergraduate degree in architecture, and then I went on to a master's degree in recreation management and then I finished my doctoral studies at Gonzaga University in leadership studies. For undergraduate degree, I did study abroad in Copenhagen, Denmark for Denmark's international study program. And during that time, I had an opportunity to study Scandinavian architecture. What I saw is just the subtle refinements, the subtle curvature like in their Viking ship heritage. And that would translate over into their furniture design and some of their full scale architectural design. There was just subtlety and some of the curvature and form line that, that I'm attracted to. So I saw the connection between like Scandinavian culture and then back home, we have like a plateau cultural heritage. And so I just see that kind of parallel that when I came back home, I really wanted to celebrate that, that complexity uh, about our culture back home here in Eastern Washington. Part of my, ar my architectural and arts recovery process it's all about doing ethnographic research, doing historical photo research, and then also having elder presence where you, you speak with elders and have them be present. And then through that process, there are some communities who put on workshops. Um, for example, the, the Wanapum tribe is historically known for keeping their Thule Mat Lodge housing uh, culture alive. And so I attended a workshop such as that to learn about Thule Mat Lodges. So they did, uh, basically the Kalispell tribe has done open workshops. Uh, for example, Francis Kaluuya of the Kalispell tribe invited me up for a Western white pine bark harvest workshop. And that was back in 2012. And so that was very helpful in my journey, uh, especially with bark sturgeon nose canoe. 
that workshop was very instrumental in learning about the materials of the canoes. During my tenure process, I discovered in the ethnography that there's ancestral tools that our ancestors used to make these canoes. And one of them, uh, one example would be when you're harvesting western white pine bark. When I did my first harvest, I used a plastic spatula from Walmart, of all places, and used that plastic spatula to help separate that bark from the, the, from the log. But then I discovered in an ethnography report that they made special tools to do that, either out of an elk rib bone or a deer antler that has that curved shape. And that allows you, and that tool allows you to kind of form to the shape of the log to help carve that bark off. That's my next journey is to start using the ancestral tools. So I just finished my 10th season in bark sturgeon nose canoe sculpting. And I also finished my ninth year in the Salish and Sturgeon Nose Canoe Method, which is a method I developed in 2013. And that means that this, is, this has got a unique frame assemblage and skin attachment method that's unique to me, whereas the bark canoes are since time immemorial. But this canoe here is since 2013, Sean Brigman. When I started uh, bark sturgeon nose canoe making in 2012, I couldn't find the bark to skin that canoe because our forests are depleted of all that western white pine. So I knew early on I, I needed to find a contemporary method, and so that's why I developed this Salish and Sturgeon Nose Canoe, and that was in 2013. I've noticed a lot of the boat cultures from, from North America and into Canada are using the ballistic nylon as an interpretation. So whether it's their umiak or whether it's whatever their canoe form, this is a good experimental material to stretch onto their canoe frame. So that would include the kayak makers, some of the boat makers. And so I figured, well, why don't I give that a try with ballistic nylon? However, with ballistic nylon, if you try to put this ballistic nylon on a bark sturgeon nose canoe, this will just crush the frame of a traditional canoe. So I actually had to redesign and retrofit the frame to accommodate the ballistic nylon. It's like a drum. When you put raw hide, animal rawhide on a drum and it dries, the rawhide shrinks and it'll crush the frame. So they've, they've over-engineered the drum frame to accommodate it. Well, same thing with this. I had to basically design the frame to now accommodate the ballistic nylon. So for example, on a bark sturgeon nose canoe, the only thing that's holding the frame together is what's called bitter cherry bark lashings and cedar root lashings. Those are not strong enough to prevent the ballistic nylon from, from crushing the frame. So we had, to, and we had to substitute in new materials and redesign the wood frame to accommodate that ballistic nylon. So on this canoe right here, my contemporary Salish and Sturgeon Nose canoe, the only thing that's actually traditional on it is the ribs. I could have went out and bought bamboo stock or white oak stock and steam bent it into ribs. But I, but I chose to just stick with the traditional ribs, which would be Rocky Mountain maple. So that's actually the only thing that's traditional on this canoe is the Rocky Mountain maple ribs. This canoe is actually built to my dimensions. So I did my rib spacing based on my hand dimension like this. The whole reason I recovered Bark Sturgeon Nose Canoe is so that the next generation of youth can start to abstract it into furniture design, abstract it into house design, or sculptural design, or even jewelry design. I've taken it and abstracted it into glassware. Uh, someday I would like to maybe do furniture design. But the, where I see it going into the future, that's up to the next generation of youth to abstract that into something new. Whatever that art discipline is, that's up to them. As a plateau-specific cultural form, the bark sturgeon nose canoe represents the marriage patterns, food gathering patterns, indigenous ways of knowing and being, and even a sturgeon fish, important as a traditional food. The bow and stern of the historical canoe relates to the shape of the nose of a sturgeon, for perhaps it was the fish that once inspired the shape and design. When I think of strengthening our communities, I think of the ancestral village sites along the rivers and lakes. I think of the architectural heritage, the frameworks like canoe frames, housing frames, 
and how all village frameworks are connected. My arts practice passes on the traditional life ways of plateau tribal communities by physically demonstrating that these artistic implements are not to be celebrated as static relics of the past, but as a contemporary continuity with the present and future as a living art and architectural heritage. So I was just going to take everyone on a tour around the hype space here, just so you can see what it takes to be able to make canoes. Um, without a space such as this, I wouldn't be able to work on multiple canoes at the same time. Let's give this a try. So I wanted to start with this garage door here. So this garage door allows me access outside and inside to bring in all my equipment, all my tools. And then they also provide shelf space over here for all your tools. I brought in a table saw. Also a jointer, there's a wash station. And during my artist residency, I was able to skin a bark canoe for the Burke Museum in Seattle. And so in this space, I was able to use water and the water could just fall on the floor So the artist space is designed for, for water. And give me a second to turn the lights back on. Yes, and so this is the bark sturgeon nose canoe I made for the Burke Museum. And this was actually based on a Shushua ethnography report from Kamloops, British Columbia. And my grandfather actually survived the Kamloops Indian Residential School. And so this has kind of been a healing journey to, to reconnect with relatives up in Kamloops on the Kamloops Indian Reservate, Indian Band. And so it's been a healing journey with this canoe as well. I'm kind of winging it here. <laughs> and also, well, you're the, doing a great job, okay? And also in the hive space here, uh, I finished my seventh paddle. And so this paddle represents the seven generations of the seven scoots for the scoot design on the sturgeon. And then the 215 to represent the 215 unmarked graves up in Kamloops. And so this final paddle, I'll, 
a most likely gift to a family member up in British Columbia. And there's also an interpretation of this paddle down at the Mac Museum in the canoe exhibit down there. And then I'll conclude with some of the materials on the bark canoe. So this is, this is the Western white pine bark that gets harvested out of North Idaho and also Northeast Washington. This piece of bark actually came off a 2012 harvest with the Kalispell tribe up near Priest River, Idaho. So I saved this piece of bark as just, uh, just as a memory of that workshop. To waterproof uh, the bark sturgeon nose canoe, uh, I collect pine pitch and mix that with bear fat. So this is actually a supply of bear fat that should last me for the rest of my career. And that's to waterproof the bark sturgeon nose canoe. And this is an example of the ribs. So this is Rocky Mountain maple. And then this is bitter cherry for the lashings to lash a bark sturgeon nose canoe. And as stated at the beginning, I've made five bark sturgeon nose canoes. And then for my contemporary canoe, I've made over 30 of these contemporary canoes behind me. And so I'll just end with that and just open it to questions for anyone who's interested. So just a reminder that you can enter your questions into the chat, or if you raise your hand, you can ask verbally. I think there is a question in the room as to what the cost is um, for you to sell them. Well, um, the industry standard across North America for the bark canoes is minimum $500 per linear foot for a bark canoe. And that standard was set by some of the canoe makers back east, like in the Eastern Woodlands. So minimum for a, a bark canoe, it's $500 minimum per foot. Some canoe makers charge upwards of $1,000 per foot. Now for my contemporary canoe behind me, I charge significantly less than $500 per foot. Hey, Sean, this is Aaron, Aaron Miles. It's hey, good Aaron. to see you. I haven't, see, I haven't seen you in years. It's, uh, I think the last time I saw you was on U of I campus, probably in early 90s. So uh, yeah. it's good to see you doing well and revitalizing your culture. Thank you. Good to see you, Aaron. At WSU, U of I. <laughs> yep, that's right. And I just want to point out that my, my, educate, my educational background, it all came together as full circle for me. So it really was interdisciplinary, just my education in architecture, youth recreation, and then to complete an, a doctoral degree in leadership studies with a focus on ancestral built environments, just bought, brought all this together for me. And so I'm just very thankful for those educational opportunities. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Again, you can enter them into the chat or you can raise your hand to ask verbally. When is the next canoe journey? Um, yes, we can ask some of the members of uh, so, some of the organizations around here. Actually, I don't, I know that the Kettle Falls canoe journey happens during summer solstice in June, but some of the communities might have earlier canoe journeys. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. 
Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Are there any more in the room? Oh, uh, Silas, go ahead. Sean, I was just curious with your work, if there's a youth component, if you're taking on interns to learn this skill or how are you passing on the knowledge to the next generation? Yeah, since 2012, I've done all of the above, uh, but, but mainly my focus was just to get through that first 10 years to get the bark sturge nose canoe back and to ensure the integrity of it. I, I turn 49 next month. My goal by the time I'm 55 is definitely to get back into the, into the elder um, youth, um, what do you call that? Um, apprenticeship type mentality to get back to that. But these last 10 years, I've been so busy with the recovery of the canoes that that's where all my focus went. Uh, that, that, that my next goal by, by the time I turn 55 is to get back into the, the youth apprentice uh, type formula. Awesome to hear, and you're doing fantastic work. Thank you for sharing today. Thank you. Hi, Sean. Uh, this is Randy Madison from Regenton Art Talk. I just wanted to thank you so much for being here with us today and for the time that you took with Hamilton Studio to make this film. Um, my my uh, excitement of having you present this is that um, it really demonstrates the connection between the work that we all do here to help protect the environment um, and all of our tribes and all the work that we're doing because it illustrates, you know, the, the intersection of everything that we have, that nothing is, is um, separate, everything is connected. So the work that we do, say if your specialty is air or water or what have you, it all ties into our culture and to these things that mean so much to us your ability to make these canoes and to bring it back, it brings um, awareness to the spiritual nature of, of the transformative power of not only art, but tradition and how, you know, we can't separate this. And this is one of the reasons why we at um, Region 10 really like to highlight these cultural presentations because it's not just environmental work that we do. It, it is soul work, it's heart work, it's family work, it's community work, um, it's art, it's, it's all of the above. So I just wanted to thank you so much for bringing that awareness to our, um, to our summit this year. Yes, thank you for the opportunity.